I met him first, I say, in 1929, through the intervention of a friend of my common friend, who asked Mr. Gandhi to see me. And so Mr. Gandhi wrote to me, saying that he would like to see me. So I went and saw him. That was just before going to the round table conference. And then he came to the second round table conference. Didn't come for the first. And he was there for about five, six months. And there, of course, I met him also and faced him also. Then, once thereafter, he also, after the signing of the Pune Pact, asked me to come and see him. So I went to see him. He was then in jail. But that's all the time that I have met him. Uh -huh. But um, I always say that as I met Mr. Gandhi in the capacity of an opponent, I have a feeling that I know him better than most other people because he had opened his real fangs to me and I could see the inside of the man. You see, while others who generally went there as devotees saw nothing of him except the external appearance which he had put up as a Mahatma. But I saw him in his human capacity, the bare man in him. And so I say that I, I understand him better than most of, his, most of the people uh, who have associated himself, themselves with him, can say. So how would you sum up what you found in him? Well, I, I must say at the outset that I feel quite surprised. You see, at the interest is the outside world, Western world particularly, seems to be taking in Mr. Gandhi. I cannot understand that. So far as India is concerned, he was, in my judgment, an episode in the history of India, never an epoch maker. Gandhi would, has already vanished from the memory of the people in this country. His memory is kept up because the Congress party annually, you see, gives a holiday, either on his birthday or some other day connected with some event in his life, has a celebration every year going on for seven days in a week. Naturally, people's memory is revived. But if these artificial respirations were not given, I think Gandhi would be long, long forgotten. You don't feel then that uh, he fundamentally changed the aspect? Of not at all. Yeah. Not at all. In fact, he was all the time double dealing. He conducted two papers, one in English, the Harijan, and before that, uh, Young India, and in Gujarat, he, he, he conducted another paper, you see, which is called the Deen Bandhu or something like that. Now, if you read the two papers, you will see how Mr. Gandhi was deceiving the people. In the English paper, he posed himself as an opponent of the caste system and of untouchability and that he was a Democrat. But if you read a Gujarati magazine, you will see him a more orthodox man. He has been supporting the caste system, the Varnashram Dharma, and all the orthodox uh, dogmas which have kept India down all through ages. In fact, somebody ought to write Mr. Gandhi's biography by making a comparative study of the statements made by Mr. Gandhi in his Harijan and the statements made by Mr. Gandhi in his Gujarati paper. So there what? are seven volumes of it. The people, the Western world only reads the English paper where Mr. Gandhi, in order to keep himself in the esteem of the Western people who believe in democracy, was advocating democratic ideals. But you got to see also what he actually taught to the people in his vernacular paper. Nobody seems to have made any reference. All the biographies that have been written of him, you see, are based upon his Harijan and the young India, but not upon the Gujarati writings of Mr. Gandhi. And what were his real intentions with regard to the scheduled castes in the structure? Well, he, he only wanted, you see, there are two things about the scheduled caste. We want untouchability to be abolished. But we also want that we must be given equal opportunities so that we may rise to the level of the other classes. Mere washing off of untouchability is of no consequence. We have been carrying on with untouchability for the last 2,000 years. Nobody has bothered about it. You see, nobody is bothered about it. Yes, there are some, some disabilities which are 
very harmful. For instance, people can't take water, and people can't uh, have land, you see, to cultivate and earn their livelihood. But the other things which are far more important, namely that they should have the same status in the country and that they should have the opportunity to hold high offices so that not only their dignity will rise, but also they will get what I call strategic positions from which they could, uh, they could protect their own people. Mr. Gandhi was totally opposed, totally opposed. He was content with things like temple entry. Temple entry, that was all the thing that he wanted to do. Which is a very, nobody cares for temp, Hindu temples now. The untouchables have become. He is so conscious of the fact that temple going is of no consequence at all. You live in the untouchable quarters, just the same, whether you went into the temple or whether you didn't enter the temple. People, just as for instance, people at one time would not allow the untouchables to travel by railways because of pollution. But now they don't mind because the railways won't make any separate arrangement. But because they travel together in the train, it doesn't follow that their life in the villages vis-a-vis -vis the Hindus has in any sense changed. Whenever the Hindu and the untouchable allies at a railway train, see, they assume their old robes. Yes. So you would say uh, Gandhi was an orthodox Hindu? Yes, he was absolutely an orthodox Hindu. He was never a reformer. And he has no dynamics in him. All this talk about untouchability was just for the purpose of making the untouchables drawn into the Congress. That was one thing. And secondly, see, he wanted that the untouchables should not oppose his movement, Swaraj. I don't think beyond that he had any real motive of uplift. He wasn't like Garrison in the United States who fought for the Negroes.